Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, We're here from Parker Free Church of Scotland, <laughs> continuing. <laughs> we met We're Roberts. a this local we congregation. Our, our building is situated at Two Thornwood Terrace. If you go up to Barton Road, you'll come to the police no, station. Opposite the police station there, go up a steep hill. It has a traffic light on it at the moment. No, if you go up that hill, you'll come first of all to Thornwood Primary School. And our building is next door at the crossroad to Thornwood Terrace. We meet on the Lord's Day, that Sunday, 11 a.m. And again in the early evening at 6 p.m. And we extend a warm welcome to you all. You might come along and hear something more concerning the Christian gospel. We also have a, a midweek meeting on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. And you are welcome to attend any of these meetings. We would be delighted to have you with us. And as I said, we're from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. And we tend to do this once a week. We come out in the open air. And this week we are found at Partick Station in the West End of Glasgow. And we're very glad that you're able to join with us. We have individuals out who are handing out gospel tracts. Please take a tract from them. You might not be able to read them at the moment, but they'll easily slip into your pocket or into your bag. Take them home and read them. It contains a very short and we trust a very clear gospel message. Please read it and it's got our details and information there. And we do give you these details and information that you might know that we are a genuine Christian congregation here situated in Partick in the west end of Glasgow. We're not fly-by-night cowboys. We're not charlatans. We are a Scottish registered charity and we are a bona fide Christian church. And it is a, a wonderful privilege to be able uh, to come out this afternoon and to speak upon the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is Christianity? Many people today are simply rejecting Christianity. They're rejecting the Christian faith. They are rejecting God's Word. And most probably, they are simply doing this because they have listened to someone else's opinion. Well, we would urge you to take your Christianity from the Bible. Christianity is a religion of the book. And all that we seek to say to you this afternoon, we would argue, comes from this book this book of God. The Bible tells us that the Word of God has been given to us by God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And what that simply means is that Scripture the words of Scripture have been literally breathed out of the mouth of Almighty God. And therefore what we seek to draw to your attention this afternoon is not my opinion. And it is not the opinion of our congregation or our denomination or indeed the Christian Church as a whole. Instead, what we seek to draw to your attention this afternoon has the authority and the approval and the authentication of God's Word. It is God's Word to us. 
It is a message that God has given to mankind from heaven. And therefore, we would say to you, it is imperative that we listen to what we hear. The Bible tells us, you might well be familiar or partially familiar with what is regarded as the most popular and well-known verse in the Bible. What is that verse? Well, it's John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then it goes on to say, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And there in these two verses, friends, we have the very essence of the Christian gospel. For God so loved the world. What moved God to love the world? There's nothing in the world that God should love. Because God is holy. And God is pure. And God is righteous. And all of us, by nature, are not righteous. We're not pure. The Bible tells us clearly, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's God's verdict upon every single individual, from Adam onward, apart from one. And we shall speak of this person in a few moments. But that is the verdict of God. That is what God says concerning mankind. For there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And therefore there is nothing lovely or lovable in the world as far as God is concerned. Yet we are told for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God gave his priceless, this priceless gift to us. What is that gift? That gift is his Son. Who is his Son? Well, the Son of God became the Son of Man. And we know him as Jesus Christ. The second person in the blessed uh, eternal trinity came into this world and took upon himself a human nature, a true body and a reasonable soul. And he lived in this world in order that he might work out a salvation for us. Now he came, he came into this world, not by ordinary generation, no, he came by extraordinary generation. He was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by a miraculous operation of God the Holy Spirit. Now please don't think that I can possibly explain that to you impossible it is something that is a marvel it's a miracle yet it happened and after the conception the lord jesus christ was born in the normal manner in that sense he came into the world as we would come into the world no different and for a period of time he lived a perfect life in obscurity in Nazareth and there he fulfilled all that was required of him from the law of God up until that time when he began his public ministry when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the river Jordan and there the Holy Spirit came upon him and the voice came from heaven which said 
This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And he was set apart to undertake a public ministry. And he began it with zeal and with enthusiasm. And he went around the synagogues in Galilee and Capernaum and Judea. And he preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he preached wonderful things. The people noticed that this man speaks with power and with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees, that is, not like the other religious leaders. This man was unique. He was speaking with the authority and the power of God. And this man performed many, many miracles. We hear of the lepers he cleansed. We hear of the deaf who had their eyes open so that they could see. We hear of the lame who had been lame even from their birth. And when they met the Lord Jesus, what happened? They were healed so that they were able to walk. Indeed, they went about leaping and dancing because they had received strength to their legs and to their ankles. And the Lord Jesus Christ performed many, many miracles. And all of these miracles were signs. And they were telling the people round about that this person here is no ordinary individual. He is the Messiah. He is the long promised Messiah, Messiah. And he has come. And by his teaching, and by his preaching, and by all he undertook, he demonstrated that he was the Messiah that the people of Israel had been looking for. But you know what happened, I'm quite sure. You know that the religious leaders had no time for him. Why? Because they exposed, or he exposed, their hypocrisy. And they hated him. And they eventually turned him over to Pilate, demanding that he be crucified. What a terrible thing to do. To demand that an innocent man be crucified. And Pilate, because he knew that Jesus was innocent, he wanted to let him go. But they said, no, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. And they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. That's what they said. They brought down a divine implication upon themselves when they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Messiah. Well, Christ went to the cross and ultimately Christ died. He was taken down from the cross and he was put into a tomb. And there he remained on the Friday night and on the Saturday night. But friends, we are here this afternoon to tell you that on the Sunday, on the first day of the week, on the Christian Sabbath, what happened? The Lord Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. The tomb could no longer hold him. Death could no longer hold him. His time of humiliation had ended. He was now alive, and he's alive forevermore. And the Savior that we proclaim to you this afternoon is a Savior who's alive. He's not in a crib, and he's not on a cross, and he's not in a tomb. He's in heaven, and he sits at God's right hand uh, this afternoon, <laughs> awaiting that day when his enemies shall be made his footstool. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. This is the Savior that we proclaim to you this afternoon. And friends, this is the Savior that you must know, that you must follow, that you must trust, that you must call upon, because he's the only one that can save you. How, pos how can he possibly save you? Well, he will save you from your sins. How can he save me from my sins? He can save from sin, friends, because he has been punished in the room and in the place of sinners. A few moments ago, I spoke about how he was crucified by Pilate. 
wicked men handed him over to Pilate and they demanded that Pilate would crucify him. Well, wicked men did what they did and they will give account for what they did. But we have to know and realize that it was all part of God's plan. It was all part of God's plan of redemption. This is what God had planned in the ages of eternity, if we can use that expression. This is what God had devised in order to work out a salvation, in order that sinners might have their sins forgiven. Someone had to die in the room and in their place. And that person was none other than the eternally begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ the Lord. That's why he came. That's why he took upon himself a human nature. That's why he had a body. In order that he might be able to suffer. In order that he might be able to die. We say this reverently. But as the Son of God had he remained in heaven, he could never save. He could never save a single soul. Why? Because mankind had sinned and mankind's representative had to die in the place of sinners. And that representative, friends, is Jesus Christ the Lord. And that's why we come out this afternoon. That's why we leave our, our manses and our pulpits and the warmth and the comfort of our churches. And we come out to the marketplace. We come out to where people are. And we seek even for a moment or two to draw your attention to this great person. Because the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved what a glorious and a wonderful and a full promise there whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved now how can you possibly call upon someone you know nothing about or why should you call upon the Lord Jesus if you do not know your great need and this is why we come out because we acknowledge, we realize, we live in the real world and we know that today in the world that we live in, very few people go to the house of God and therefore very few people hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore because they don't hear and they don't recognize their plight, why would they call upon someone to save them when they don't know or don't recognize their need to be saved. And surely, friends, this is the first thing that we must realize. However painful it might be, or however humbling it might be, we must recognize that we need Jesus Christ. Why do we need Him? We need Him because the Bible tells us, it tells the minister, it tells everyone here, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, you might well say, well, I agree with that. I know that I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect, you might say. Well, but it's not really a great problem, is it? Well, I have to tell you, it is a great problem. It's a problem with God. It's a problem with your Creator. It's a problem with the King of Heaven. And if you think you'll get into Heaven as you are, then you need to think again. Because the Bible says that nothing impure shall enter in. That is, nothing sinful shall enter into Heaven. Now we acknowledge we are sinful. And therefore, as we are, by nature, it is impossible for us to get into heaven. How many of you this afternoon think that when you pass into eternity, how many of you think 
that you'll simply march into heaven, that there's a place for you. Well, friends, we must realize that is not the case by nature. We have to be prepared for heaven because we are not prepared for it by nature. There must come a great change. And that, and what the Bible calls that change, ye must be born again. Oh, minister, how can I be born again? The only way that you can be born again is by the Spirit of God coming upon you. That's the only way. But that's necessary. It's indispensable. You'll not see the kingdom of God or you'll not enter into it unless you know the wonder and the glory of the new birth. How then can this come about? It is, comes about, friends, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And we must realize that we need this change. And we must cry out for it, although we cannot manufacture it ourselves. This is something that God and God alone does. It is a work of God the Holy Spirit. How do we know if we're born again? If it's a work of God and we cannot do it ourselves, how do we know if we're born again? You'll know if you're born again if you believe upon Jesus Christ. That's the evidence. That's the proof. And if you today are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can be assured you are not born again. You are still dead in your trespasses and sin. And that's why we come out. We come out, friends, to tell you this great good news from heaven. Let me bring a text to your attention from the Bible, from Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Here the prophet Isaiah is not talking about himself. He's not. He's talking about another. When he says, look unto me, it's looking unto the Saviour. Who's the Saviour? There's only one Saviour. And his name is sweet. His name is precious. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this text is telling us to look unto Jesus and be ye saved. He's the only Saviour. There is no other Saviour. You know, there are many, many religions. Many. Somebody counted them some time ago. And there were 4,200. Well, that number will be out of date by now, for sure. Will be out of date by sure. But, all of these religions, they cannot save. There's only one Savior. Who is that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In other words, no one will get to heaven. No one will see the Father. No one will live in heaven unless Jesus takes them. He is unique. He alone can save. And therefore we want to come out and to tell you about this person. And that you would not be like those who gathered on that day when he was crucified. And when Pilate wanted to set him free, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. What did they do? Well, they simply rejected him. Now, you cannot crucify him, but you can reject him, just like they did. God does look after us, sir. That's correct. You're quite true. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's good, yeah. 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 Ye
But no, you're not lucky, you are blessed. We don't, we don't believe in luck, sir. We believe in the providence of God. The one who orders and directs all things. But do you believe in Jesus? Do it. God made it. Uh, I mean, no, that's fine. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Heaven and earth shall pass away. A Partick, you know, it's a Partick, three church of Scotland today. No, no, we're up in Thornwood Terrace, beside the school. We took over, we, we took over the US church. Oh, yes, Ian Quinn. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why I am, it's quite a nice chap really. Okay, every blessing, sir. And who was in the future? <laughs> we always say worse. Well, I hope so, we hope so. Uh, we're all worse than each other, you know. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, we just go out and preach. Well, everyone, young, old, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the colour of their skin. Or even, even older, yes. Have a good day, sir. Look unto me, the Bible says, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. There's no one else can save you, friends. There's a day coming when we'll stand before him, when we'll give account, when books shall be opened, and we'll stand to give account of the things that we've done. How will on that day? I tell you, you'll need a saviour that day. But that day to look for the Saviour will be too late. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the time to get right with God. You must call upon Him now. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth. That's telling every one of us. It doesn't matter our age or sex or the colour of our skin or the language that we speak. We're all sinners in the sight of God. There is none righteous, no not one. We're all like sheep, we've all gone astray. For there is no difference for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And we cannot get right with, with God by our own effort or achievement or good works or money or whatever. Cannot. There's only one way to get right with God. Salvation is found and none other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And that name, I'm delighted to tell you this afternoon, that name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternally begotten Son of God, who came down from heaven in order to seek and to save that which was lost. And friends, we must realize that we are lost by nature. What does that mean by nature? Well, it just means, just as we come out of the womb, by nature, we are lost. Why are we lost? We are separated from God. We are dead in trespasses and sins. We do not like God. We hate God. We're estranged from Him. And therefore, we need to be saved. We're lost. And Jesus Christ is the only one that can save. And that's what the Bible says. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. We're going to take a short break. Another one of the brethren will speak to us. But may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us this afternoon. We read in God's holy an infallible word from Psalm number 14. The word of God reads to the chief musician, a psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. 
of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge, who eat of my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord. There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. He has shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. The people of Hartic become as believers in Jesus Christ, to share this life-giving message. It is a life-giving message not because it comes from us. It is because it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes as revealed in the holy and infallible word. Holy scripture. And in Psalm 14, it points out our nature. It points out and shows us that all of sin is short of the glory of God. It points out to all of us that it is a foolish thing to reject God. It is a foolish thing to say that there is no God. In Psalm 14, verse 1, it says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Friends, look around you. Observe the creation. It has a creator. It has all the marks of a mighty and all-powerful God who made all these things. The sun, the moon and the stars, the clouds, and all these good things that we enjoy have been made and ordained by Almighty God. The heavens declare the glory of God and they show forth His handiwork. So that friends, all are without excuse. You look around you, you take a seat on a park bench, you know that somebody has made that. And friends, as we look at the creation, at its beauty, its complexity, its order, we see that it has a creator, a wise, good, holy creator. And so it is a foolish thing, as the psalmist tells us, to say in our hearts that there is no God. That's what sin is, friends. It's the rejecting of the rule of God. It's the rebellion against the rule of Almighty God. It is saying no to God. And we would rather rule and reign over our own kingdoms rather than submit so holy God, that's us all by nature. All of us have sinned. All of us fall short of the glory of God. And friends, you come sharing a message, but for the grace of God, no. so Your would we be changed. there? You reckon? We yes. too would reject Better God, as the psalmist is pointing <laughs> out. The only way to have wisdom is by the mercy and the grace of God. The who has said in his heart there is no God, they are corrupt. That is us all. We have not been made sinners, but born in sin. We have all broken the law of God, born in Adam. And as soon as we come out of the womb, we are at war with God. We need the grace of God. They are corrupt. They have done about more works, there is none that doeth good. Many of us think we're not that bad. Many of us, when we look at the perfect, righteous, and holy standard of God, we think, well, I can't merit hell, can I? But friends, that's what we all deserve, myself included. The Christian realizes that by their own work, they are corrupt. The Christian realizes that they have broken the law of Almighty God. And recognizing their guilt, they see that they cannot save themselves. They deserve the wrath of God. 
but they then flee to the refuge and the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And so we come with this message that you too would see, number one, your sin, but number two, that there is a Savior, a willing Savior, who receives all that was in Him, and in Him alone, the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. Because there's none good, no without one. It says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. See, friends, none of us seek after God. There's none that do it good, no, not one. And we may think, well, that sounds very extreme. It might even sound very harsh. But none of us, by nature, seek out after God. It is God who changes the sinner. Friends, you need Christ. And we pray that this day you would have eyes to see and ears to hear, eyes to see your sin and to see a beauty in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord looked down from heaven to see if there are any that understand. Friends, we call upon you to look to Jesus. But why do you need this Savior? What did Jesus do? Jesus, who is true God and true man, came into the sin-cursed world. He suffered for his entire life. The creator of heaven and earth. He assumed to him self a human nature. And as one person, through God, man, he suffered upon the cross, bearing the wrath of God. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ took our penalty. He took our sin. He took the wrath of God. He was crushed, bruised for our iniquity, so that whosoever looketh upon him shall not have to face eternal death friends we pray that you would see your need you would see this corruption in our in your hearts found in every human heart and see the perfect righteousness that jesus offers to all who look to him and to him alone oh friends we pray that you would see this this day that you would see your need and seek after God by grace and by grace alone. They're all done aside, the psalmist writes. They're all together become filthy. This is every single one. None escapes it. We've all broken the law of God. Part of the law of God says if you love the Lord to God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, there's not one of us who has done that perfectly. Actually, there's not one of us who has done it for any length of time while upon the face of the earth. There is only one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who perfectly loved His Father in heaven. There's also the second great commandment. To love your neighbor as yourself. And as you go through the commandments, the fifth commandment to honor your father and your mother all the way down to thou shalt not covet we have all broken these commandments not just in our actions but in our thoughts and in our words we are guilty condemned under the law in our own works but in jesus christ no longer the case if you look to him if you have seen him Trusted in Him. No longer having confidence in yourself. Having confidence in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. He is the one who has done good. Every moment of His life. Fulfilling perfectly the law of God. Keeping it in every jot and every tittle. So that if you are on Jesus Christ. 
and you've trusted in Jesus Christ, God no longer Jesus sees your sin. Are you a good reader? Um, can you read me that glass? I hope so. You have been washed, yeah, cleansed yeah, yeah. in the blood of Christ. Those who look to Jesus and to Him and to Him alone. And not only that, have you been washed? If you look to Jesus, you have been clothed, clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. So that if you're in Christ, by faith and by faith alone, the Lord looks upon you with the light. That is not possible outside of Christ for any of us, myself included. Of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge. To eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. We pray this day would be the day of your salvation. This day would be the day when you see the folly of sin. They say that you would see the brevity of life. And you would see that this life is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. Our life on this earth is so short. And Jesus, who is love and mercy, offers you forgiveness, eternal life in Him. Which is more important? Our brief momentary life in this world or eternity with Jesus? Forgiveness in Christ. The righteousness of Christ offered to all who have trust in Him alone. He has paid for it all. It says the psalmist writes, they were in great fear. For God is in the generation of the righteous. He has shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. In verse 7, Oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion. Zion, that place referenced in the scriptures. Mount Zion, the picture of the presence of the blessed presence of Almighty God. And the only way we can come and experience those blessings from Almighty God is in and through Jesus Christ. We must be viewed as righteous. Romans 1, 17 says the just shall live by faith. We must be seen as just in the sight of the law of God. And none of us, none of us, none of us have kept the law of God. Not just that we've broken the law of God, but none of us have kept the law of Almighty God. But we need that salvation to come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of His people. There's a picture here in the scriptures of His people being set free, redeemed. Whether that's the redemption that they find being brought out of spiritual Babylon or being brought out of Egypt. Sin is miserable, friends, and service of it is tormenting. It is a cruel taskmaster. And you will find liberty in Jesus, but you will find slavery and captivity. Here you will think you are free. You probably think, now I live as I please, but you are the servant of sin. You are the servant and slave of unrighteousness. You follow the flesh, the world, and the devil. But friends, there's true liberty in Jesus Christ. Freedom from slavery. Freedom from that which is a cruel taskmaster. That is sin. That is the flesh and that is the world. In Jesus, there is freedom. This is the freedom spoken about here. The Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice when there is freedom from captivity. When there is freedom from the bondage of sin, pictured in the Bible as the exodus out of Egypt, or the deliverance from captivity in Babylon, being set free from the city of destruction, and being brought home 
those who look to Jesus to a heavenly home being brought to a heavenly city to New Jerusalem the Lord bringeth back the captivity of people Jacob shall rejoice and when you look to Jesus there is rejoicing it is a joyous thing many people say that they would like to go to heaven or that they believe that they're going to heaven but why? heaven is a place of supreme joy but why is it a wonderful place? why is it a place that anyone would want to go to? heaven is a place of no sin heaven is a place of perfect righteousness heaven is a place of enjoying God forever and friends, unless you have trusted in Jesus, that's not going to sound very appealing, is it? The two options before you are heaven and hell. Heaven through Jesus Christ. Those who look to Him, those who see Him, those who see His beauty and wish to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. But then there is hell. And that is for all those who reject the gospel of Christ, who wish to trust in their own righteousness, who think they're not that bad, who think they're good enough. But friends, we will all stand before the, the throne of God. And when we, when we stand before God, naked, in our own works, answering for our own crimes before God, or will we stand before God washed by the blood of Christ clothed in His perfect righteousness you see the difference friends it is a wonderful message it is a wondrous message and so the people of God when they see Jesus and be in the presence of Him they will rejoice and find gladness in Jesus and Israel shall be glad. And friends, we urge you this day, do not seek salvation in yourself. Do not seek salvation in this world. It will one day turn to dust. Seek salvation in Jesus. You are not your own lawgiver. You are not your own maker. You are not your own creator. There is a God. You may reject Him in your mind and in your heart, but He still exists. He made all that we see around us. The heavens declare the glory of God. And it shows forth His handiwork. We see evidence of his handiwork all around us and it reveals in the creation he is a good God he is a holy God he is a God of order a God of righteousness and that is the God you and I will all have to stand before one day friends it does not have to be in your own work if it is in your own work the end well, it will be judgment. But if it is clothed in the righteousness of Christ, because you've looked to Him and to Him alone, you rejoice in His salvation. You rejoice in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. No longer rejoice in your sin. The friends, heaven is wonderful but heaven is wonderful because Jesus is there because the blessed presence of God is there because there is the joy of the Lord for all eternity there without that what is heaven? I want you to think of that do not be what the psalmist writes here the fool hath said in his heart there is no God no longer think this way friends it is rejecting the obvious that we see all around us but what we need to see by faith and by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone is that in him 
is only found in Jesus Christ. And you might think I'm too much of a sinner. I've done too many bad things. You have no idea what I've done. The Lord will save you, friends, if you will come to Him today. He will wash you. He will cleanse you. And He will clothe you. So that when you come to the presence of God, He will say to you, who trusted in Jesus Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh friend, we pray that you would find salvation. We pray that you would find rejoicing and joy in the presence of the Lord. And that you would be saved from your sins. Saved from what we all deserve, myself included. And that is hell for all eternity. That is eternal death for all eternity, but there is eternal life found only in one name, and that is in the name of Jesus Christ, who is true God, true man, and he reigns forever and ever. Amen. We're glad you're able to join with us for our open ear outreach this week. We're coming from Party Station in the west end of Glasgow and we're delighted you're able to be with us. There are people out, we're handing out gospel tracts. If you would please take one. I realize that you might not be able to read it at the moment, but put it in your pocket or your bag and please read it. It gives us our details. Details and it's there that you might know that we are not the cowboys. We are a bona fide Christian congregation and we minister in Antarctic. Our premises are at Two Thornwood Terrace, Upton Barton Road, opposite the police station, Gloucester Hill. You'll come to Thornwood Primary School and we are next door on the crossroads. We would extend a warm welcome to you to attend any one of our public services. We meet on the Lord's Day, that Sunday at 11 a.m. And we also meet in the early evening at 6 p.m. And we also have a midweek meeting and we meet on Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. And we do issue a warm and sincere welcome to you. Our services are open to the public. Our services are very clear and simple. And uh, we realize that maybe you haven't gone to a place of worship for some time. Maybe you've fallen out of habit because of the COVID experience. Or maybe you've never gone to a place of worship. And you might think it's a strange experience and you might be maybe apprehensive about coming along. Well, please let me assure you that we would love to see you and uh, come along. No obligation whatsoever. We're not out to embarrass anyone. We simply want you to come with us that we might have an opportunity to bring to your attention the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are not ashamed of him, friends. You know, many people might be ashamed of him, but we're not. And we're not ashamed of him because he is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. And he is God's only begotten Son. And in the fullness of time, he came down from heaven yeah. and he took upon himself our form and our nature and that means he became just like us he took a human nature and a true body and a reasonable soul and he did this because he wanted to secure the salvation of his people and this is what was required. I like the right. 
right, could never save right us right in, in heaven. Be, he had to say, this come, a glorious film, and he had to be like us, that's and he had to live in this world. People, people love it, though. And ultimately, it by, he had to offer yeah, up himself as a once-for-all perfect sacrifice. And on that sacrifice, what was happening? Well, God was punishing him in the room and in the place of sinners. How can we understand this? Well, God was punishing him instead of mankind. There are people here today who are going into Morrison's and they're going to buy some things. And maybe they come to the till and they, what do they find? Oh, well, they don't have their card and they don't have their wallet and therefore they cannot buy the things that are in their trolley. And they've got a predicament. What if someone else came along and said, Madam, I'll pay for your groceries. Will Morrison's accept that? Of course they'll accept it. They'll gladly take the money. You can take the goods. Someone else has paid for them on your behalf. Well, that's what happened with Jesus Christ. We are sinners. There's no argument about that. The Bible makes it clear. It doesn't flatter us. It's the humblest. And it tells us clearly and plainly, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, we've missed God's mark. We've missed the standard. Now what is that standard? That standard is absolute perfection. That standard God requires. God is hope. God is perfect. And he demands perfect obedience to his law from every one of us. No exception. We cannot perform this. We cannot provide the obedience that he requires. Why not? Because we are sinners by nature and we are sinners by practice. We have been conceived in sin. And that is not a reference to the biological act. It just quite simply means that when we were conceived, we inherited the sinful nature of our parents. And they, in turn, inherited the sinful nature of their parents. And we could go right back to that. And therefore, when we come out of the womb, we, are, we have a sinful nature. And as you will know, that, that sinful does not. I said, why are you in there? I said, what's the difference between doing it and not wanting to know? He said, Fellas, that's itself that's important. I said, in you sinful like behavior, I said, well, you in sinful words, <laughs> and in sinful thoughts. And this, therefore, renders us sinners in the sight of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. Oh, I'd have no problem with that. That's, that'd be the easy bit. In Paul's letter to the Romans, oh, okay, in chapter so 3, at the moment, maybe he outlines the state of the unbeliever. He outlines the condition of the natural man by nature. He says in Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. There's our plight. We don't understand our problem. We don't understand that by nature, every one of us, every man, woman and child, is separated from God because of our sins. This we do not understand by nature. We think that somehow we are all right, but we're not in the sight of God. And what's more, none of us seek God. You know, some people and they talk maybe about seeking after God. Well, the 
none of us does. In fact, it's the other way. It's God who seeks after us. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's the one who came to seek and to save that which was lost. It was the Lord Jesus that took the initiative to come to heaven, from heaven to earth in order to save. It was not a cry from mankind that brought down the Savior. Instead, it was heaven moving. And this is one thing that makes Christianity unique among the world religions. What makes it unique is that God is seeking sinners in other religions, in all the other religions, it's man's attempts to get right with God. It's man trying, as it were, to climb the ladder to heaven, whereas Christianity God coming down. God came down in his Son in order to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's one reason why we come out this afternoon, that through the preaching of the gospel, we might make this person, the Lord Jesus Christ, known unto you. Because Paul says in Romans chapter 10, and I'm paraphrasing here, speaks about in chapter 10, how shall they hear unless a preacher come? And that's, that is the, the primary role of the gospel minister. He is to be a preacher. And what is he to preach? He is the searchable riches of Christ. And he is to bring the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ to bear upon every man, woman, and child. Because without the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not saved, and we cannot be saved, and we cannot be reconciled to God. And Paul goes on to describe the, the natural man. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In other words, we don't live as God would have us to live. We don't. We don't live the way that God would have us to. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And we cannot do that. And we do not do it because we are estranged and we are separated from God. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who has come to reconcile us to God. He is the only one. There is none like him. There is none that can reconcile us to God but the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why, one of the reasons why we come out, that you might be reconciled to God through him, through the wonderful Christian gospel where we are urged to put our faith and our hope upon him. And he goes on to talk about the natural man in Romans chapter 3. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used to seat the poison of ass, that is, uh, serpents, is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You know, some people tell us that the Bible's an old book, and it is an old book, and they tell us it's out of date, it's got nothing to say to us. Friends, that verse would tell us that the Bible has a lot to say to us, because it's describing modern society, and it's describing the various uses of the tongue. And do we not live in a time when the tongue is vastly used in a sinful manner. Their throat is an open sepulchre. That's talking about a grave. What's in a grave? Nothing but dead bones. It's nothing but a smelly place. And that's what many people's mouths are like because they utter, absolute utter, false, 
even in the playground, do we not find that? Even in the playground, in the nursery, do we not find that many of these young children are blaspheming God, using their tongues, cursing and swearing? And it goes on to talk, they have used the seat. Is that not what we see today? Many people speaking deceitfully. How many politicians can you listen to? How people in the public life can you listen to? They say one thing, they mean another thing. This is the misuse of the tongue. And here the Bible is highlighting it. And it's one of the sins of our day and of our generation. The poison of asps is under their lips. They're using their lips to cut people and to hurt people like the serpent does. And does this not happen today? Do we not find today in social media is it not a terrible place? Yes, it is. Where people are using tongues in a very inappropriate manner. It goes on. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Where is the thanksgiving that we should have today? Where is it? Where's the thanking of God for life and health and family and friends, food for clothing? Where do we find that today? We don't find it. Is that not true? All we have, friends, is people whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Maybe that describes you. I don't know. I'm not a judge. But maybe it does. How often do you swear? How often do you use the F word? How often do you blaspheme God? You might think, well, these things are not important. Friends, they are important. What is the third commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold them guiltless who taketh his name in vain. It's a terrible thing to take the Lord's name in vain. How often have you said, Oh God, Oh Christ, Oh the Lord Jesus Christ. How often have you said this? Even we hear it in school among the children. It's a terrible thing. Nobody seems to matter. It doesn't matter to many people. But it does matter to God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold them guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Dear friends, it's a, a chief sin of our day, even among the very young and the very old, those who are just moments away from eternity. What are they doing? They blaspheme God. Do we fall into that category? Well, friends, I want to tell you, if you do fall into that category, I want to tell you there's a saviour. Yes, there's a Savior who will save you from all your sins. Who is that Savior? That Savior is Jesus Christ the Lord, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Paul goes on to describe the natural man. Their feet are swift to shed blood. They love violence. That's what they love. They love fighting. They love bitterness. They love death. Is that not what we find today? Are we not living in a very violent society? Have we not seen it in America? Have we not seen it in other parts of the world? Have we not seen it in Glasgow? Have we not seen violence all around us? Then their feet are swift to shed blood. And that's why you like Do we not see it in our hospitals? I, I know, I was raised Do we not see it when parents go to the hospital to that's literally Jesus. Yeah. It gets very <laughs> Abortion, is it not a terrible thing? Born. Well, the, well, the is, is that not terrible? Does that not split the bill? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Then, does not the Bible describe our society? Don't tell me the Bible's out of date. The Bible is contemporary. It's dealing with issues. 
that are real and live today. We live in a violent society. Is there not a, is there not a move to try to bring about euthanasia? If we get sick too old or if we get too sick, is there not a mentality? Oh, let's just kill them. Their feet are swift to shed blood. The Bible says. No, we're not in the gospel. Destruction and misery are in their way. And the way of peace have they not known. And my friends, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Do you have a fear of God? Adam and Eve had a fear of God when they sinned. They ran away from Him. They had a fear of God before the sin, and that fear would cause them to run to Him. They loved Him. They worshipped Him. Ignored Him. But after they sinned, and that fear would cause them to run away from God. And maybe that's what you're doing this afternoon. You're running from God. That's why maybe you've never come to the house of God because you're frightened that you might hear something that you don't like. You have a faith in God, but you're running away from Him. Well, friends, the way to deal with the fear of God is run to Him. Call upon Him. Call upon the Savior whom He has provided. That's why we come out this afternoon that we might introduce the Savior to you and that you might call upon Him. The Bible tells us, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Oh, to the young people that are passing by, to the young people and maybe not to the not so young people hear what the bible says to you this afternoon remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say i have no pleasure in them what are the evil days well, the evil days will come upon us. What are they? They are the days of old age. And they're evil because, generally speaking, the days of old age are more difficult. When we're young, when we're fit, when we have all our faculties, the young days are good days. We don't have any difficulties. We don't have any health issues normally. We're fit, we're young, we can do what we want. But the day will come, friends, and it'll be older than you think. When you'll be older. And you won't have the same kind of energy, quality, and you won't be able to do the things that you're doing now. These are the days when someone will have to look after you. When someone will have to care for you. And what the Bible would urge you is to make your peace with God now. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Remember them, how good thy Creator is to you. Remember the Savior. Come to the Savior today. Dedicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Serve Him throughout your life. Give the best of your life to Christ. That's what it means. Yes, yes. Remember in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I it. Because friends, with a new creature, yes, we have new life. The Corinthians, therefore of any he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new.
Is this not what we need? We need a change. We need new life. We need new power. This can only come to us by the Holy Spirit when we are born again. That's what Jesus is talking about. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're going to draw our time to a close shortly, friends, but before we do, I want to impress upon you, are you going to heaven? Or, as some other people say it, are you going to paradise? Do you know if you're going to paradise? Or are you going to heaven? Do you know it? Some people say, well, you can't know it. Well, the Bible says you can't know it. And I want to tell you about someone who did know it. He got up in the morning and he was a hell-deserving sinner. In fact, he was in the top. He was part of a, a murderous gang. And he was going to be crucified along with another one of his colleagues. And someone else was going to be crucified with them. It was Christ Jesus the Lord. And here Christ died at nine o'clock in the morning. He was put, a tree was put in the ground and a cross was put in the ground and Jesus was laid upon the cross and they put hand, they put nails through his hands and through his feet and they tied a rope around his waist and then they put him in a, in, on the cross put, put the cross in a hole in the ground and they hung the Saviour there but there were two other men beside him and they were thieves and they were murderous thieves and they were getting what they deserved for their crime and they too were crucified and for three hours yes three hours people were hurling insults at the lord jesus and so were the thieves but then something happened something changed one of the thieves looked at the lord jesus and said remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom here he was a wicked individual, one who was involved in a, a murder, and he was being punished. Something happened, a change came upon him. He began to realize that there was the Son of God, and he was going into eternity, and he was not ready or prepared for eternity. And he turns to Jesus and says, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What did Jesus well, say to this, that man? This, this Do you know? Or you need to know what he said to this man. Nature. You must know it. What did he say? What did Jesus say? Jesus said to that man, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Yeah, yeah. Here was a man who got up in the morning and he was heading straight for hell. And the Lord Jesus Christ says to him a few hours later, today, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not next century, but today thou shalt be with me in paradise. This man was changed. This man was converted. This man performed no good works. This man could not give any money to the church. This man could do nothing. He was tied to a cross. Look to the Saviour, and the Saviour said to thee, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Friends, the moment that you trust upon Jesus Christ, you are saved. That moment that you truly trust upon Him, you are saved. Your place in heaven, your place in paradise is assured. You cannot earn it. It is by grace, but it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, and not by works, so that no man may boast. Where will you stand then on that day? On that great day of judgment? Will you have a saviour? Or will you be condemned? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. 
according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's why we come out, friends, because there's an awe coming. Everyone shall stand before King Jesus and we shall give account. You'll give account of your thoughts, of your words, of your actions. You'll give account of what you did today because the gospel in some sense and in some degree has been presented to you. The claims of Christ have been presented to you. What have you done with Jesus Christ? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Then, on that day, you will want a Savior. But on that day, it will be too late. The day is the day of salvation. Now is the time to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day of grace. As Paul goes on to tell them in Corinthians, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Call upon him. Don't be afraid. You don't need a minister. You don't need a priest. You need Christ. How can I get him? You must call upon him. Cry out to him. That the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man who thought. I'm saying how you The Lord will have mercy upon him. See, yes, God, it's been good to be with you this afternoon. We're going to draw our time to a close. We have a meeting tonight in the church, and we want to prepare for that. But may the Lord be pleased to, to bless His word to you. And God willing, we shall be back to seek to preach the everlasting gospel to the poor and needy sinners of Partick in Glasgow.